Introduction to the book Speeches and Letters of Abraham Lincoln, 1832 to 1865, edited by Merwin Rowe, 1907, by James Bryce, first Viscount Bryce, United Kingdom Ambassador to the United States of America, 1907 to 1913. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. No man since Washington has become to Americans so familiar or so beloved a figure as Abraham Lincoln. He is to them the representative and typical American, the man who best embodies the political ideals of the nation. He is typical in the fact that he sprang from the masses of the people that he remained through his whole career a man of the people, that his chief desire was to be in accord with the beliefs and wishes of the people, that he never failed to trust in the people and to rely on their support. Every Native American knows his life and his speeches. His anecdotes and witticisms have passed into the thought and conversation of the whole nation as those of no other statesman have done. He belongs, however, not only to the United States, but to the whole of civilized mankind. It is no exaggeration to say that he has, within the last thirty years, grown to be a conspicuous figure in the history of the modern world. Without him, the course of events not only in the Western Hemisphere, but in Europe, also would have been different, for he was called to guide at the greatest crisis of its fate a state already mighty and now far more mighty than in his days, and the guidance he gave has affected the march of events ever since. A life and a character such as his ought to be known to and comprehended by Europeans as well as by Americans. Among Europeans it is especially Englishmen who ought to appreciate him and understand the significance of his life, for he came of an English stock, he spoke the English tongue, his action told upon the progress of events and the shaping of opinion in all British communities everywhere, more than it has done upon any other nation outside America itself. This collection of Lincoln's speeches seeks to make him known by his words, as readers of history know him by his deeds. In popularly governed countries, the great statesman is almost of necessity an orator though his eminence as a speaker may be no true measure either of his momentary power or of his permanent fame for wisdom courage and tact bear little direct relation to the gift for speech but whether that gift be present in greater or in lesser degree the character and ideas of a statesman are best studied through his own words this is particularly true of Lincoln, because he was not what may be called a professional orator. There have been famous orators whose speeches we may read for the beauty of their language or for the wealth of ideas they contain, with comparatively little regard to the circumstances of time and place that led to their being delivered. Lincoln is not one of these. His speeches need to be studied in close relation to the occasions which called them forth. They are not philosophical lucubrations or brilliant displays of rhetoric. They are a part of his life. They are the expression of his convictions and derive no small part of their weight and dignity from the fact that they deal with grave and urgent questions and express the spirit in which he approached those questions. Few great characters stand out so clearly revealed by their words, whether spoken or written, as he does. Accordingly, Lincoln's discourses are not like those of nearly all the men whose eloquence has won them fame. When we think of such men as Pericles, Demosthenes, Aeschines, Cicero, Hortensius, Burke, Sheridan, Erskine, Canning, Webster, Gladstone, Bright, Massillon, Vergniaud, Castellar, we think of exuberance of ideas or of phrase, of a command of appropriate similes or metaphors, of the gifts of invention and of exposition, of imaginative flights or outbursts of passion fit to stir and rouse an audience to like passion. 
we think of the orator as gifted with a powerful or finely modulated voice an imposing presence a graceful delivery or if remembering that lincoln was by profession a lawyer and practiced until he became president of the united states we think of the special gifts which mark the forensic orator we should expect to find a man full of ingenuity and subtlety one dexterous in handling his case in such wise as to please and capture the judge or the jury whom he addresses one skilled in those rhetorical devices and strokes of art which can be used when need be to engage the listener's feelings and distract his mind from the real merits of the issue of all this kind of talent there was in lincoln but little he was not an artful pleader indeed it was said of him that he could argue well only those cases in the justice of which he personally believed and was unable to make the worse appear the better reason for most of the qualities which the world admires in cicero or in burke we should look in vain in lincoln's speeches they are not fine pieces of exquisite diction fit to be declaimed as school exercises or set before students as models of composition what then are their merits and why do they deserve to be valued and remembered how comes it that a man of first-rate powers was deficient in qualities appertaining to his own profession which men less remarkable have possessed to answer this question let us first ask what were the preparation and training abraham lincoln had for oratory whether political or forensic born in rude and abject poverty he had never any education except what he gave himself till he was approaching manhood not even books wherewith to inform and train his mind were within his reach no school no university no legal faculty had any part in training his powers when he became a lawyer and a politician the years most favorable to continue a study had already passed and the opportunities he found for reading were very scanty he knew but few authors in general literature though he knew those few thoroughly he taught himself a little mathematics but he could read no language save his own and can have had only the faintest acquaintance with european history or with any branch of philosophy the want of regular education was not made up for by the persons among whom his lot was cast till he was a grown man he never moved in any society from which he could learn those things with which the mind of an orator or a statesman ought to be stored even after he had gained some legal practice there was for many years no one for him to mix with except the petty practitioners of a petty town men nearly all of whom knew little more than he did himself schools gave him nothing and society gave him nothing but he had a powerful intellect and a resolute will isolation fostered not only self-reliance but the habit of reflection and indeed of prolonged and intense reflection he made all that he knew a part of himself he thought everything out for himself his convictions were his own clear and coherent he was not positive or opinionated and he did not deny that at certain moments he pondered and hesitated long before he decided on his course but though he could keep a policy in suspense waiting for events to guide him he did not waver he paused and reconsidered but it was never his way either to go back upon a decision once made or to waste time in vain regrets that all he expected had not been attained he took advice readily and left many things to his ministers but he did not lean upon his advisers without vanity or ostentation he was always independent self-contained prepared to take full responsibility for his acts that he was keenly observant of all that passed under his eyes that his mind played freely round everything it touched we know from the accounts of his talk which first made him famous in the town and neighborhood where he lived 
his humor, and his memory for anecdotes, which he could bring out to good purpose at the right moment, are qualities which Europe deems distinctively American. But no great man of action in the nineteenth century, even in America, possessed them in the same measure. Seldom has so acute a power of observation been found united to so abundant a power of sympathy. These remarks may seem to belong to a study of his character rather than of his speeches, yet they are not irrelevant, because the interest of his speeches lies in their revelation of his character. Let us, however, return to the speeches and to the letters, some of which, given in this volume, are scarcely less noteworthy than are the speeches. What are the distinctive merits of these speeches and letters? There is less humor in them than his reputation as a humorist would have led us to expect. They are serious, grave, practical. We feel that the man does not care to play over the surface of the subject, or to use it as a way of displaying his cleverness. He is trying to get right down to the very foundation of the matter, and tell us what his real thoughts about it are. In this respect he sometimes reminds us of Bismarck's speeches, which in their rude, broken, forth-darting way always go straight to their destined aim, always hit the nail on the head. So too, in their effort to grapple with fundamental facts, Lincoln's bear a sort of likeness to Cromwell's speeches, though Cromwell has far less power of utterance, and always seems to be wrestling with the difficulty of finding language to convey to others what is plain, true, and weighty to himself. This difficulty makes the great protector, though we can usually see what he is driving at, frequently confused and obscure. Lincoln, however, is always clear. Simplicity, directness, and breadth are the notes of his thought aptness clearness and again simplicity are the notes of his diction the american speakers of his generation like most of those of the preceding generation but unlike those of that earlier generation to which alexander hamilton john adams marshall and madison belonged were generally infected by a floridity which made them a byword in europe even men of brilliant talent, such as Edward Everett, were by no means free from this straining after effect by highly colored phrases and theatrical effects. Such faults have today virtually vanished from the United States, largely from a change in public taste to which perhaps the example set by Lincoln himself may have contributed. In the forties and fifties, Florid rhetoric was rampant, especially in the West and South, where taste was less polished than in the older states. That Lincoln escaped it is a striking mark of his independence as well of his greatness. There is no superfluous ornament in his orations, nothing tawdry, nothing odiose. For the most part he addresses the reason of his hearers, and credits them with desiring to have none but solid arguments laid before them. When he does appeal to emotion, he does it quietly, perhaps even solemnly. The note struck is always a high note. The impressiveness of the appeal comes not from fervid vehemence of language, but from the sincerity of his own convictions. Sometimes one can see that through its whole course the argument is suffused by the speaker's feeling, and when the time comes for the feeling to be directly expressed, it glows not with fitful flashes, but with the steady heat of an intense and strenuous soul. The impression which most of the speeches leave on the reader is that their matter has been carefully thought over, even when the words have not been learnt by heart but there is an anecdote that on one occasion early in his career lincoln went to a public meeting not in the least intending to speak but presently being called for by the audience rose in obedience to the call and delivered a long address 
so ardent and thrilling that the reporters dropped their pencils and, absorbed in watching him, forgot to take down what he said. It has also been stated, on good authority, that on his way in the railroad cars to the dedication of the monument on the field of Gettysburg, he turned to a Pennsylvanian gentleman who was sitting beside him and remarked, I suppose I shall be expected to say something this afternoon. Lend me a pencil and a bit of paper. And that he thereupon jotted down the notes of a speech which has become the best known and best remembered of all his utterances, so that some of its words and sentences have passed into the minds of all educated men everywhere. That famous Gettysburg speech is the best example one could desire of the characteristic quality of Lincoln's eloquence. It is a short speech. It is wonderfully terse in expression. It is quiet, so quiet that at the moment it did not make upon the audience, an audience wrought up by a long and highly decorated harangue from one of the prominent orators of the day, an impression at all commensurate to that which it began to make as soon as it was read over America and Europe. There is in it not a touch of what we call rhetoric, or of any striving after effect. Alike in thought and in language, it is simple, plain, direct. But it states certain truths and principles in phrases so aptly chosen and so forcible that one feels as if those truths could have been conveyed in no other words, and as if this deliverance of them were made for all time. Words so simple and so strong could have come only from one who had meditated so long upon the primal facts of American history and popular government that the truths those facts taught him had become like the truths of mathematics in their clearness, their breadth, and their precision. The speeches on slavery read strange to us now when slavery as a living system has been dead for forty years, dead and buried hell deep under the detestation of mankind. It is hard for those whose memory does not go back to 1865 to realize that down till then it was not only a terrible fact, but was defended, defended by many otherwise good men, defended not only by pseudo-scientific anthropologists as being in the order of nature, but by ministers of the gospel, out of the sacred scriptures, as part of the ordinances of God. Lincoln's position, the position of one who had to induce slave-owning fellow citizens to listen to him and admit persuasion into their heated and prejudiced minds, did not allow him to denounce it with horror, as we can all so easily do today. But though his language is calm and restrained, he never condescends to palter with slavery. He shows its innate evils and dangers with unanswerable force. The speech on the Dred Scott decision is a lucid, close, and cogent piece of reasoning, which, in its wide view of constitutional issues, sometimes reminds one of Webster, sometimes even of Burke though it does not equal the former in weight, nor the latter in splendor of diction. Among the letters, perhaps the most impressive, is that written to Mrs. Bixley, the mother of five sons who had died fighting for the Union in the armies of the North. It is short, and it deals with a theme on which hundreds of letters are written daily. But I do not know where the nobility of self-sacrifice for a great cause, and of the consolation which the thought of a sacrifice so made should bring, is set forth with such simple and pathetic beauty. Deep must be the fountains from which there issue so pure a stream. The career of Lincoln is often held up to ambitious young Americans as an example to show what a man may achieve by his native strength, with no advantage of birth or environment or education. In this there is nothing improper, nothing fanciful. The moral is one which may well be drawn, 
and in which those on whose early life fortune has not smiled may find encouragement. But the example is, after all, no great encouragement to ordinary men, for Lincoln was an extraordinary man. He triumphed over the adverse conditions of his early years because nature had bestowed on him high and rare powers. Superficial observers who saw his homely aspect and plain manners, and noted that his fellow townsmen, when asked why they so trusted him, answered that it was for his common sense, failed to see that his common sense was a part of his genius. What is common sense? but the power of seeing the fundamentals of any practical question, and of disengaging them from the accidental and transient features that may overlie these fundamentals, the power, to use a familiar expression, of getting down to bedrock. One part of this power is the faculty for perceiving what the average man will think and can be induced to do. This is what keeps the superior mind in touch with the ordinary mind, and this is perhaps why the name of common sense is used, because the superior mind seems in its powers of comprehending others to be itself a part of the general sense of the community. All men of high practical capacity have this power. It is the first condition of success. But in men who have received a philosophical or literary education, there is a tendency to embellish, for purposes of persuasion, or perhaps for their own gratification, the language in which they recommend their conclusions, or to state those conclusions in the light of large general principles, a tendency which may, unless carefully watched, carry them too high above the heads of the crowd. Lincoln, never having had such an education, spoke to the people as one of themselves. He seemed to be saying not only what each felt, but expressing the feeling just as each would have expressed it. In reality, he was quite as much above his neighbors in insight as was the polished orator or writer, but the plain directness of his language seemed to keep him on their level. His strength lay less in the form and vesture of the thought than in the thought itself, in the large, simple, practical view which he took of the position. And thus, to repeat what has been said already, the sterling merit of these speeches of his, that which made them effective when they were delivered and makes them worth reading today, is to be found in the justness of his conclusions and their fitness to the circumstances of the time. When he rose into higher air, when his words were clothed with stateliness and solemnity, it was the force of his conviction and the emotion that thrilled through his utterance that printed the words deep upon the minds and drove them home to the hearts of the people. What is a great man? Common speech, which after all must be our guide to the sense of the terms which the world uses, gives this name to many sorts of men. How far greatness lies in the power and range of the intellect, how far in the strength of the will, how far in elevation of view and aim and purpose, this is a question too large to be debated here. But of Abraham Lincoln it may be truly said that in his greatness all three elements were present. He had not the brilliance, either in thought or word or act, that dazzles, nor the restless activity that occasionally pushes to the front even persons with gifts not of the first order. He was a patient, thoughtful, melancholy man, whose intelligence, working sometimes slowly, but always steadily and surely, was capacious enough to embrace and vigorous enough to master the incomparably difficult facts and problems he was called to deal with. His executive talent showed itself not in sudden and startling strokes, but in the calm serenity with which he formed his judgments and laid his plans, in the undismayed firmness with which he adhered to them in the face of popular clamor, of conflicting counsels from his advisers, 
sometimes even of what others deemed all but hopeless failure. These were the qualities needed in one who had to pilot the Republic through the heaviest storm that had ever broken upon it. But the mainspring of his power, and the truest evidence of his greatness, lay in the nobility of his aims, in the fervor of his conviction, in the stainless rectitude which guided his action and won for him the confidence of the people. Without these things neither the vigor of his intellect nor the firmness of his will would have availed. There is a vulgar saying that all great men are unscrupulous. Of him it may rather be said that the note of greatness we feel in his thinking and his speech and his conduct had its source in the loftiness and purity of his character. Lincoln's is one of the careers that refute this imputation on human nature. James Bryce End of Abraham Lincoln An Introduction by James Bryce Read by David Wales